Hello. Hello. That should be fine. Um, Perfect. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Awesome. Hi, so I'm gonna just be repeating myself a lot. I can't, I I can't see the slides though, I don't know. Oh yeah, I'll share screen in a second. Okay. Um, hi everybody, thank y'all so much for joining. My name is Katya, pronouns she, her, a, yeah. And I'm gonna go ahead and share screen in just a moment. Uh, we'll be starting the webinar at 11.05, just to give people some time to join, but thank you to all of those of you who are here already. Awesome, and we'll just have some music playing in the background. It's taking a minute to load. Oh, I, I stopped sharing as soon as it loaded. Okay, awesome. So this is the Reviewing Your Financial Aid Awards letter um, webinar. And I'll let our speaker introduce themselves in just a moment. Um, but um, for those of y'all who just joined, we'll be starting at 11.05, so just hang tight. If you're wondering why your camera or your audio is turned off, we automatically do that for all of our webinars so that y'all are anonymous and comfortable asking any specific questions regarding your own situations, um, whether it be with financial aid or something else. Um, so we really just wanna keep your information private. We do highly encourage you, however, to interact with us throughout the presentation through the Q&A box. So there isn't a chat box, but you can use the Q&A box that should be located at the bottom um, on your Zoom toolbar. Um, you can use it to ask questions, which we will most likely be, or Robert, up to you if you wanna address them during or at the end. Um, but, but yeah, we'll be checking that. You can also just put comments in there as well. Awesome. So it's looking me. Oh, actually, I can speak up. We'll have some little bit of music playing in the background, and then we'll get into everything in just a second. Everyone, just take a next few minutes to get situated and get comfortable. I think we're going to go ahead and start. Um, by the way, for folks who maybe know someone who registered and isn't able to make it after all, we'll be recording everything and posting it on our website afterwards as well, or for y'all to refer back to and watch as many times as you need to in order to get all the information that you need. Um, but again, my name is Katya. My pronouns are she, her, a, yeah. I'm the events coordinator for Central Valley Scholars. And this is the Reviewing Your Financial Aid Award Letters webinar led by Robert, pronouns he, him. So I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. Feel free to begin interacting in the chat as y'all have questions and as they come up. Um, a little bit on Central Valley Scholars, we are an official nonprofit. Um, we do a number of different programs, all centered around helping um, Central Valley students, you know, find avenues to higher education if that's what they wanna choose. We do it through workshops. So these public workshops that we also have, mentorship programs, which are 
similar to or do similar workshops, but on a much more intimate level. So you get to um, have one on one mentor or mentors, um, presentations and hands on activities um, related to the workshops that you're learning about throughout your whole academic year. Um, so you can check all of these resources out on our website, which is linked below centralvalleyscholars.org. Um, we also do scholarships and this year, pretty big deal. We're doing uh, giving away over $12,000 worth of scholarships and you can also check them out on our website. They should all be due around June 30th. So you still have some time to, still have plenty of time to apply. Um, and we have scholarships ranging from the first LGBTQ scholarship in the Central Valley to first gen scholarships and documented student scholarships, black student scholarships, and you know a lot of other ones. So please check them out. We highly encourage y'all to apply. Um, if you have any questions, you can always either follow our social medias to get the most up-to-date information, check out our website. There should be a contact email on there, or you could even just ask us in the chat today. But um, yeah, so those are some of the things that we offer. Feel free to ask questions about that as well today. Awesome, next thing. So we're gonna go ahead and do a very quick land acknowledgement. I know that over Zoom, we're all in different geographies and different places, and maybe not everyone who's joining us today is from the Central Valley, but for the purposes of this land acknowledgement, we do kind of make it specific to the Valley. But since y'all already have audio and visuals off, I just encourage you to maybe plant your feet on the floor, get grounded as we as I read off this land acknowledgement. Close your eyes, do some deep breaths, whatever you need to do to get comfortable in the space. I want to take a moment to acknowledge where we are, that the earth below our homes and below our feet is Yokut's territory. That is where the majority of the Central Valley is. So that's why we um, name that territory specifically. And it has belonged to and been tended to by the Yokut people for hundreds of thousands of years. And when white settlers arrived to what we otherwise know as the United States, they enacted genocide and theft of labor, land, and resources, attempting to wipe out indigenous communities entirely. It's important to acknowledge the land we're living on and to recognize our history and relationship to the ongoing legacy of colonization in the US and to also recognize that the Yokuts people are still here and that through resistance and resilience are still on the front line struggling for land rights, collective liberation and an end to white supremacy. I invite you to take a moment and think about your relationship to this land and its history and let those who have come before us in the struggle inform us on where we're going so that together we can reimagine and can collectively build a world where we're all free. So with that, just take your final deep breath, begin to open your eyes again if you have them closed and get ready to come back into this space. Awesome, so with that, it is my pleasure to introduce you all to our speaker, Robert Hume His, and I'll go ahead and hand it off to you, Robert, to talk a little bit about yourself and um, share as much as you would like with our students today. All right, great, Katya. Well, thank you guys for inviting me to be here today and talk about uh, financial aid. I've worked in higher education for over 14 years, about 15 years. Um, I'm originally from Visalia, California, uh, and I've worked in, like I said, financial aid for many, many years, um, different types of institutions, uh, some for-profit schools, community college, uh, public, uh, public uh, four-year universities, um, private school, grad school. So I have a wide um, breadth of knowledge in how financial aid works at all these different institutions. And that's one of the things I like about Central Valley Scholars is that you know um, we're encouraging post-secondary education, whether it's vocational, the traditional associates uh, or bachelor's degrees. So I'm excited to be here and share with you today. Um, thank you very much for having me. So, in today's sessions, we're, we're going to have um, about seven objectives um, that we'd like you to gain after attending today. And they're here on the screen. So we want you to be able to say, I learned how to review an award letter, including key terms um, that I need to know relate to college expenses and financial aid. We want you to be able to say, I explored various award letter formats and learned how to navigate the different terms used, um, that I have a better understanding of my options to pay for colleges, including grants, scholarships, work, study, and loans. I understand how col college affordability works and how it's calculated. I feel comfortable using tools like Decided to answer my questions about college affordability and financial aid. I feel comfortable using Decided um, to add colleges and upload award letters so I can review them. And I feel more confident about choosing the right college for me using tools like Decided and Swift Student and by working with my school counselors, family, and advisors. So 
you may have noticed I mentioned uh, Decided and Swift Student. These are going to be online resources that I'm sharing with you today to help you understand your financial aid award letters. So you may be wondering why is it so complicated to talk about college affordability and how to pay for college. And it's challenging to talk to families about financial aid and affordability because uh, it, it's confusing. Um, you know, the nation's one trillion in student debt is fueled by confusing and unclear pricing and college costs. So how can we confidently talk about uh, something that is so unclear by design? Um, this leads to bad outcomes at the individual level that rolls up to the school district, county, and state levels. Nationally, about two and three college seniors graduate from public and private nonprofit colleges with debt, and it continues to increase each year. Uh, the Public Policy Institute in California highlighted in their report that high college costs have caused students to rely on loans. Student borrowing at the UC is about 40% among first-time freshmen, and CSU borrowers are close to 38%. Students are more likely to take out loans at private colleges by at the rate of 53%. So this problem has led to students and families to navigate this process with limited guidance and poor information on their own. So navigating your path to college is already difficult enough for first gen and low income families. And you know, these tools provided by organizations um, like MoneyThink, uh, which is the decided tool, are here to help you um, clarify that because they don't think it's very fair. You know, the system as is isn't, isn't fair. So um, to talk a little bit more about the college affordability problem, we've learned that less than 5% of four-year colleges are considered affordable for low-income students. Um, and the reality is why we often talk to students about the option of going to, this is why we often talk to students about going to um, a two-year college and transferring to a four-year. It, it has a lot to do with college affordability. Um, we also know that the nation's 1.7 trillion dollars in student debt is fueled by confusing and unclear pricing in college costs, which we've already mentioned. And there was recently a report um, on student debt based on the class of 2019, and it shares, more than, shares that more than six in 10 college seniors who graduated from public and private nonprofit colleges in 2019 had student loan debt, and they owed an average of just over $28,000. Um, so financial aid awards, they are, you know, confusing and they're a big part of this problem, which is one of the reasons we're having the webinar today. Um, you know, there's 143 unique terms that are used for the word loan. Um, this means that sometimes families don't even know when loans are being presented to them in their financial aid award. Um, about 70% of letters group all aid together, and they don't explain the differences between grants and scholarships, loans and, and or loans and work study. So this is especially problematic. Uh, since some of that money is available before you start your school, so you can use it to pay bills right away, while money, while, while money like work study um, isn't available to you until later, until you've actually earned it. So moving along, you know, this is kind of showing where we are in the college admissions process. Um, you know, you just started your first steps of the journey. Um, right now you're choosing the colleges to apply to, or you've already chosen the colleges to apply to, and you know, you've know you submitted your financial aid forms. So you're right here where we're looking at the forms and we're comparing our options to enroll. And this is really where um, tools like Decided uh, and Swift Student can come in and help you with the process. So before we get there though, I wanna talk a little bit more about um, college cost of attendance. Um, so that's basically looking at the price tag of the college. It's important to understand uh, the two categories of costs that go into the college cost of attendance, um, or also known as the student budget. And these are your direct costs and your indirect costs. So um, your direct costs are billable. They're expenses that'll be due to the college. So you're going to see those on the college student bill. For a majority of the students, this will include uh, things like tuition, fees, room and board, meal plans. Um, you know, if a student lives off campus um, and they have off campus housing, then the housing costs will need to be accounted for and that's accounted for in the indirect costs. Um, so that's when you're off campus, you'll see uh, room and board move to the indirect cost side because you'll be paying uh, you know, your landlord and not be paying the school for on campus housing. So it's a good segue into what indirect costs are. Indirect costs, um, unlike direct costs, you know, on the other hand, they're expenses that the student and the family that you're going to need to plan for. 
and be prepared for. And they can vary, you know, from student to student, from school to school. So these are expenses that are associated with being, uh, you know, a college student and, and that you'll have to pay. But once again, you're not going to see it on a student bill. So these include things like your travel expenses, um, you know, even just taking the bus, um, books, supplies, personal expenses. Um, and you have a lot of influence over your indir indirect costs, or you have more influence over them, rather, um, other than, you know, comp uh, sorry, as compared to your direct costs. So your indirect costs, you know, you have control, for example, over books. Um, instead of buying new books, you're buying used books. Or, you know, instead of eating out a lot on the personal expenses and getting Starbucks, you know, you're cutting back. So once again, you know, with, I think what's really important is that the indirect costs, students have control over those. So when you're looking at your, your cost of attendance, just kind of remember there is a little bit of wiggle room with those indirect costs. Um, you know, so knowing, knowing the price tag of college is, you know, just kind of half, half of our equation. To get a better understanding of the cost of a specific college, it's important to, be the, to view the financial aid being offered uh, and to get a sense of that affordability for that specific college. Uh, financial aid is, is broken up into two categories. You know, we have gift aid, and this accounts for any grants and scholarships. Um, it's the money that students don't have to pay back. You want to maximize these types of financial aid. Um, then the second type here we have is self-help. And self-help encompasses student loans, which they do need to be paid back. Um, and this is, they also have interest. And then it also encompasses work study. And this money, work study money, it's not guaranteed. This is where students will be able to secure, if, if um, able to find a job on campus or a work study job on campus, they'll be able to secure that. And then they earn the up to the work study amount. Um, you know, so I think when, when, when going over your financial aid and understanding your college costs, it's important that we're looking at both the cost of attendance and the financial aid package being offered. You know, um, a high price tag doesn't always mean unaffordable, just like a low price tag doesn't always mean that it's affordable. Um, it, really it really depends on, on looking at both the cost and the financial aid that's being offered to you. So I hope that, um, you know, some of you have your award letters ready or will have them ready after this webinar. Um, And you know, places that you'll find your award letters is you know they they can be emailed to you. They may be sent to you physically in the mail, or you may have to log into your online portal and see what your award uh, looks like. So award letters they do come directly from the college. Um, and for California students, so you know, hopefully, I think we're all pretty much in California. If we're out of state, uh, you know, I'm sorry, I'm speaking specifically to California. Um, but the Cal Grant and Chafee Grant. You'll get more information about those awards um, on your Web Grants for Students portal. Um, so there's, you can see there's already different portals that you'll be checking to check up on your financial aid. Um, Web Grants for Students is the one for the California grant, or the Cal Grant and Chafee Grant. Um, so sometimes you'll see that you've been approved for it in the Web Grants portal, but it may not be on your actual school portal. So those are some things to, to kind of think about. Um, as you're going, you're going over this. So we're gonna go over um, some award letters now because um, we kind of have some of the groundwork and the basics of the financial aid terminology, terminology and the different types of financial aid that students and families can access. Um, so we're gonna take a look at award letters um, and um, it's important that that you know, students keep track of their award letters from colleges because this will be the key information that they'll need in finding out their options um, for college affordability um, and whether or not a college is affordable for you. So, you know, award letters can be very um, can can vary from college to college, despite there being you know federal guidance from the Department of Education. Um, as mentioned before, there's about 143 um, different ways uh, that they use the word loans. To describe federal loans, less than 33% of award letters differentiate between a gift aid and loans, making it difficult to know what families actually need to pay. Um, they're also misleading and vague information around parent plus loans and work study. Um, you know, they, they include these in the package, but we know that this, these types of loans, uh, the plus loan and work study, 
may not actually be A that's there when you're, when you're starting school. Um, the only 40% of the awards include a calculation of what students would need to pay above and beyond uh, for financial aid. And there are 23 different ways of calculating the remaining costs. So 30% of letters uh, include grants, but they don't include college costs to compare. So you can see that the reality of award letters is they're confusing and there's no standard way. We're gonna take a, a closer look at some examples here um, of how they can be misleading. So we'll take a look at example one, which is uh, the upper uh, award letter, the, the one right above, yeah, that one, the, the, the tallest one there. Um, here we see that it's misleading calculation of net cost. And why is it misleading? Uh, because they load up credit-based aid, which are loans, and they say it's that the student has a zero out-of-pocket cost at the end there. So credit-based aid, like loans, they shouldn't be automatically considered um, the way the college is considering it. Um, because in the example, almost $37,000 in loans is the gap that the family needs to account for. So you can see how in, in this top example, you know, them including that large credit-based loan, um, it, it could also say, you know, B plus loan or it can have a different name, that they're including that as part of the financial aid package to say that, hey, you don't have any, any need after what we've offered you. Um, an example two, which is the uh, letter to the right, we see that this award letter is misleading about the parent plus loan as well. In the award, it says that it's offered. However, for parent plus loans, you still have to apply for the loans and approval is based on credit worthiness. So in other words, that money, you know, once again, it's not guaranteed and it shouldn't be considered um, a confirmed part of the award. Then moving on to our third example, an example number three, which is in, in the uh, left, um, it's misleading because they're trying to exclude the word loan <laughs> from uh, their letter. The three items that say uh, direct subsidized, direct unsubsidized, direct parent plus are all in reference to loans. Um, so because they don't clearly say loans, you might not realize that that's what you're looking at and that you're accepting. Um, so you wanna take a few moments to be sure that you see this, that the issues that I've referenced in each of these award letters Take a look at um, you know, your award letter if you have it in hand or pulled up on your screen. You, know, you wanna circle or highlight anything that looks similar or funky to these or just kinda are unclear. Um, you know, so that's a few different examples there. Um, we have a couple more. Um, our, our next example, example four, uh, let's see, oh yeah, there we go. <laughs> Uh, so this one's our next example, and you can see that the word letter has included loans as optional, but use that amount in their out-of-pocket calculation to come up with the zero dollar out-of-pocket cost. Um, so in reality, uh, they're expecting the students to have thirty-eight thousand plus dollars in loans to meet that zero out-of-pocket cost. So once again, they're they're asking you to borrow to meet your cost of attendance. Um, and then lastly, we can see here an example. Um, Five, that they offered a student 5,500 in federal sub and unsubsidized loans, and then listed uh, $26,517 in parent plus loan, which once again, they're not, the parent plus loan isn't guaranteed uh, because it, it, it is based still on credit. Um, so in, in truth, the out-of-pocket cost to the student and the family will be over $30,000 in loans, and it's not um, a zero, zero cost to attend. So these are just kind of examples of how, how award letters can be confusing. Now that we've seen those, we want to kind of move on to an example of an effective award letter. Um, so this award letter, it shows a complete cost of attendance. So um, you can locate that there, the, the cost that's going to attend both direct and indirect costs. It has a clear award summary with subtotals of the different aid that's split up. So it has grants, loans, and work study. And it references what you have to do next um, in order to uh, you know, complete your financial aid and accept your financial aid. So this is a pretty, a pretty good example of, of an award letter. Um, here's, uh, we'll review a few more um, examples. Uh, this one is from a, a CSU. It happens to be um, Cal Poly. 
And so, and then we're also going to re review um, a UC example. So in this example, we're, we're guiding a student through the Cal Poly award letter and uh, they'll need to accept or decline their offers. Uh, we encourage the students to always accept all free gift aid and any work study offered. Um, since that's the money that you, uh, you know, gift aid, you don't have to pay back work study, you're, you're earning it. Um, and, you know, on here, you know, I, sorry, we're not too interactive, but I don't know if you can tell whether or not the student has accepted all their gift aid. So that's one thing, um, you know, they actually haven't accepted all of their, their gift aid. Um, because the first two on the top of the award, if you notice, they've been offered their scholarships um, and those haven't been accepted. So it's just a reminder to make sure that you're accepting all of your gift aid there. Um, and then I think one thing that I wanna uh, point out on this, this screen is that, you know, this, these are just the awards. It's not the cost of attendance. Um, so once again, it's just, you know, trying to make that decision. Uh, here's a, an example of a UC uh, financial aid award. So some colleges, they will pre-accept um, aid on the student's behalf to ensure that they get the free gift aid. Um, and this is kind of a reinforcing best practices. It's great if schools do this, um, but students one will need to uh, really look at the status and make sure that they're accepting uh, the aid if it's not accepted. Uh, for Cal Grant A in this example, it's included in the, in the gift aid, but it's flagged as unconfirmed pending additional steps uh, to receive the award. So when a student sees this, this may they may need to go to their college portal or their web grants for students and uh, do a couple more um, action steps. Um, like, for example, um, on the web grants, they may not have um, updated the college that they intend to enroll in. So once you do that on web grants, the the Cal Grant will be confirmed with the college and then it will no longer be a um, unconfirmed or pending, pending award. So we have a couple more examples. Um, these are some private college letter examples. Um, and we're gonna be reviewing a private nonprofit independent college, which is St. Mary's College. And we're also gonna be looking at an HBCU. So um, St. Mary's College is, is in uh, Moraga, California. And the second one is for Notre Dame de Nemer. Um, so in, in both of these examples, we see that the colleges do not really help organize the award to group them into gift aid and self-help aid. So, you know, once again, it's confusing. We want to look at St. Mary's. It has 24,000 in estimated parent loans. And then um, Notre Dame, it goes a step further with the loans to show the loan origination fee. Um, this is not to be confused with the interest rate. So um, we'll go over a little bit of uh, information about loans later, but basically the government does charge you a fee for processing the loan for you. Um, so that's what the loan origination fee is. Um, they also have the cost of attendance for students to compare it to. It's broken down by semester. Um, and you should also note the difference for students with and without the health insurance fee. Some colleges require the health insurance fee in the calculation, others don't include it in the calculation. Also a good thing to know about um, health insurance is that um, you wanna reach out to your school because this can often be waived, um, which means it's not a charge that you would have if you're already coming um, with your own health insurance and it's, com it's a comparable type of insurance and plan. So if you're covered under your parents um, or someone else's uh, medical insurance, you definitely wanna see about waiving out of the health insurance um, to avoid that charge. Um, so that's one, one way to save. Um, our next letter here is from Howard University um, and it's an HBCU. Um, so students go to, who go to HBCUs, they need to may need to take out larger loans, but sometimes, um, but sometimes um, you know, they get strong financial aid packages. Um, this is just an example of one. Looking even more closely and doing the math, the student's total costs has been met. Uh, they don't need to accept any of the, the parent loans. Um, and this, so this is just a reminder to review the full package against the expenses. Um, you know, not all HBCUs or minority serving institutions are affordable. Um, it completely depends on each institution. 
And this is why we're going to be sharing some tools with you later today to see, you know, to help make your own college affordability comparisons based on the information that's that's given to you in your award letters and, um, you know, the the specific information that you have for for um, your college. So, you know, we've been talking about confusing award letters. We kind of want to know, um, you know, and the cost of college, but we kind of want to know what 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 is an affordable college. Um, you know, the, the the problem of unclear award letters are different from college to college. It's led students and families to navigate this process with limited guidance and poor information on their own because a lot of the times our high school our guidance counselors they don't know much about financial aid, and you know. Um, they they rely on outreach organizations or you know organizations like Central Valley Scholars to to put on workshops or you know local financial aid representatives to put on workshops where they help you basically complete the application. Um, so the information it's it's hard to find um, sometimes on how affordable the college is or you know what an affordable college is. So Money Think um, has kind of developed what they think an affordable college is, and that's kind of what goes behind uh, the online resource uh, decided. So um, it's a, a college is considered affordable if the gap, you know, according to many think, is less than $7,500. Um, you know, a student would be able to, to do this by taking no more than their $5,500 in loans and or working about 10 hours or less during the school year. So, um, you know, Research, you know, has been sh has shown that approximately 30 percent of award letters include no cost. This means that students see how much they're getting, but they don't have the expenses to compare compare it to. So we consider a school with a gap uh, between seventy five hundred and eleven thousand five hundred to be somewhat affordable. These schools can still be an option, but it may mean needing more support from family, work, or taking out more in loans than the recommended fifty five hundred. Um, it can also potentially mean working 15 to 20 hours during the school year. Um, we consider a school with a gap of over 11,500 to be unaffordable um, because a student in this position will struggle to cover the college bill even with family support um, while working in school and taking more and taking more than the recommended amount of loans. So taking a large amount of loans is risky due to having high monthly payments when you're paying them back. Um, which raises the risk of you of students defaulting on their loans in the future. And working over 20 hours a week can also be detriment, detrimental to your student success um, because you're not in the classroom, you're, you're working. Um, so students, you know, a lot of the time don't have the, um, the, the, the tools to get into to this level of analysis, which is why we want to share these things with you so you can start thinking about them. Um, You'll need to, you know, look once again at your total cost of attendance and um, and and your complete award letter. So the things that we've been going over today and, uh, you know, looking at your cost of attendance and then looking at your award letter and what type of awards it's made up out of. Um, and which is what we'll be giving you tools to use today as well. So what we're going to do now is we're going to kind of cal calculate your gap, which is, you know, what is not covered or uh, by financial aid, the cost that's not covered by financial aid. So when you're calculating your gap um, that's left for students and families to pay, you, you don't want to consider your loans and your work study in the award letters because we want to know how big of a gap there is after accounting for all of your direct costs minus your gift aid. Um, once we have the gap amount, the money left, um, this will give us uh, the parameter, this will give us the kind of the parameters that MoneyThink uses to define uh, affordability of a college. This will also um, enable us to, to compare award letters in terms of affordability so students can, can make a better informed decision. Um, so, you know, after you've calculated and you found uh, the gap for all of your award letters you received, you'll be able to easily compare, you know, how affordable the schools are and what your options are. Uh, you can make a well-informed enrollment decision that's best for you with affordability in mind. Um, so using the two examples here, we can see, um, you know, we've, we've kind of given examples here um, for, 
doesn't look like it's on the screen there, uh, for Sonoma and UC Santa Cruz. So we can see the both Sonoma State, which is the one on the left, and UC Santa Cruz, which is the one on the right. They both come out as affordable options. So we can use these calculations to, to, to make a plan that'll help us prepare for, for either option. If both colleges are on a, a semester schedule, then we can estimate the fall bill, which is your direct costs minus your gift aid, uh, divided by the college term schedules. So in this case, semesters are two terms. So you can divide that by two. So although both options are affordable, we can clearly see in this example here that UC Santa Cruz would be the most affordable option with a very low out-of-pocket cost. Uh, this means the student is in a position to use any money from family or a summer job to not only cover the college bill, but also to help cover some of the indirect costs for the year, um, which ultimately, result, ultimately results in a student having to borrow less um, or no loans at all. So, you know, the goal is to, to pay for college um, and have it be as, as inexpensive as possible or avoid borrowing. So this is, uh, you know, kind of what we're looking at here. Um, you know, this isn't to say that UC Santa Cruz is for sure the best fit or the right choice for the student, since, you know, there are other factors that I know go into the enrollment decision other than just affordability. So, um, you know, it's important to consider things like your majors, uh, the programs offered, you know, the vibe you're getting from the college, um, how far away from home it is, how diverse the campus is, many things will go into to your college decision. Um, so, you know, those might not be a match at UC Santa Cruz, um, but it may be at Sonoma. So the best fit may actually be Sonoma for this student. Um, you know, each family's financial situation information is different. Um, they have different circum circumstances. So these will play into to your enrollment decision. So now that we've gone over a lot of information, you know, the main question is, how do we pay for college? Um, and now that we know how important it is to look at affordability of college that students apply to, we really want to kind of drill down and, and answer this question more. But before we do, um, I want to introduce you to a couple of resources. Um, the first one here is Decided. And Decided is a tool that has been um, developed by MoneyThink, which is a nonprofit. Um, you know, it's here to explore college affordability. And it's, it's uh, hopefully a very useful um, and easy tool to use. So you know, it's, there's uh, simple steps. You're gonna create an account. You're gonna learn how, how to use Decided, which we'll go over a little bit today. Your upload, uh, which is basically uploading your award letters to the app. And then you're gonna compare and decide, compare your award letters, um, decide which school's right for you and make a plan on how to pay for it. So when you go to the app at decided.org, this is kind of the screen. You're just gonna select that you'll create a new account and you'll put in your information. Um, the account does, um, um, does have you know, a mobile app version, a web version, so you can, you can use this on different devices. Go ahead and go to the next screen. This is that, you know, just showing you once again to create your account. Step two is where you're gonna add your colleges. Um, so you're gonna be able to search for your four-year institutions all across the nation. You'll be able to add them to it there. Um, the next step after that is you know, comparing them. So it's gonna show you, these are kind of examples. You see green, it means affordable. The University of Las Vegas there has red, not affordable. San Jose State is orange, um, somewhat affordable. Um, and these kind of relate back to you know, what we went over earlier on how many things um, has set parameters for what a affordable college is. Um, so once you do that, you know, and you, and you can see what your, what your college is affordable, which ones aren't, you're gonna go make your plan. How am I gonna pay for it? And this is what's shown on the screen. It gives you more information, detailed information about loans and, um, and, and things like that. So, you know, have your award letters handy, upload them, you can take a picture of them, you can take a screenshot of them. Um, any, any of that will, will um, do for uploading it to the app and it, and it kind of showing you why a college is affordable or why it isn't. 
Um, so let's go and talk a little bit about, I'm sorry guys, I'm looking at my notes here, uh, about financial planning for college and outside scholarships. So an outside scholarship is, you know, it's, an, it's a scholarship that's awarded by an outside or organization. This could be, you know, for our dreamers, it could be the dream.us scholarship. Um, for um, other students, you know, dreamers, non-dreamers alike, we can have the Gates Millennium Scholarship, the Jack Cook Foundation Scholarship, big ones like the Coca-Cola Scholarships. These are all considered outside scholarships. And, you know, um, to help minimize that gap or to minimize the borrowing, we always encourage students to apply for as many scholarships as they can. Um, you know, it is competitive. Um, so you shouldn't bet on paying your entire college bill through college scholarships, but we definitely encourage you to apply to as many as you can. Um, let's see, you know, we want you to be aware of that even though you're bringing the scholarship money with you, scholarship uh, financial aid offices do view this money in a certain way. And there's a, a concept uh, called scholarship di displacement, which means that um, any scholarship money that you bring into the school is going to reduce the amount of, um, you know, scholarships or grant that the institution is giving you um, itself. So sometimes that happens. That's not necessarily the best practice. A lot of the times schools, there will be scholarship um, displacement, but they will start with um, the self-help side first and reduce any loans um, to help keep you out of student debt. So it, it can either, you know, the best is in terms of scholarship displacement is if you say you get that $5,000 scholarship, they reduce your loan that you're going to borrow by 5,000. So you no longer can borrow that $5,000 loan because you brought in $5,000 in outside scholarship. That's ideal. Um, the not so ideal situation is when you bring that $5,000 in scholarship and then, you know, XYZ university grant is reduced by 5,000, um, you know, because they're, they're swapping out basically the grant money that, uh, that the school is giving you for the grant money or the scholarship money that you're bringing in. Um, that's the less favorable treatment, um, but it's still, you know, good for you to know that that, that happens. Um, when bringing in scholarships. Um, so let's see here. Here's some scholarship search sites. You know, you want to check the College Board. That's a great one. Unigo, um, Niche, um, Immigrants Rising, uh, especially they have a lot of good information for uh, undocumented students there. Um, Maldef, Bold.org, all of these are great and reputable places to look for outside scholarships. Um, so make sure to check to check those out. We're going to talk a little bit um, more about work study right now. So um, when it comes to work study, you know, students can sometimes get confused on how they can use this self-help aid to help pay for college. Work study, um, they are jobs that are designated to students who completed the FAFSA application and that they demonstrate financial needs. So they qualify for this federal work study program. Uh, the work studies program is very popular and funding available at each college uh, is different. So keep that in mind. Um, that's one of the reasons why you want to submit your FAFSA early every year um, is to meet the financial aid deadlines and, and try and get some of these awards like this, like the work study award um, that, you know, they have limited funds. So they will um, not everyone, even if they are eligible for it and qualify for it, not everyone will receive it because they may run out of these funds already by the time you know, your application is received. So the earlier, the better. Um, submit your FAFSA for a chance to you know, get all of the awards possible. We're gonna talk a little bit about um, some federal student loans. For the majority of the students or students today going to college means that you're gonna need to take out some amount, amount of loans, especially for our Pell Grant eligible students and our low income students you're gonna to need to consider loans as an option. So it's important to know the sources of the loans, um, whether it's the federal government or a private loan, and just the different terms and conditions. So for federal loans, we have the federal subsidized and unsubsidized loans, and they're a good option because they offer competitive interest rates and favorable um, loan repayment terms and options. And there's the potential for loan forgiveness, depending on the type of career and, and, and job uh, you, know, you may go into after graduating. Um, subsidized is in the even better loan because it doesn't 
uh, build interest while your student is taking classes at while you're taking classes at least half time student status. So that's the good thing about the subsidized loan is that as long as you're enrolled at, at half time status, interest will not be um, building on that loan. For the unsubsidized, interest will be building the entire time. So on this next sheet here, it, um, it's we're showing your annual loan limits. Um, students' annual borrowing limits will be based on their dependency status and their year in college. Um, it's maxing out in, well, in three years, they, they kind of have three tiers there. So dependent students whose parents are not able to receive or qualify a parent plus loan, they can have additional unsubsidized loan increased um, to kind of match the independent student um, borrowing limits. Um, you see on top there, we have a dependent student limits, and then on the bottom, we have the independent students. So, you know, if students need to consider taking out loans to help pay for college, we do recommend that students use the federal loans first um, before considering parent plus loans or private loans. Um, so always borrow your subsidized loan first and, um, and your unsubsidized if needed, um, and then move on to the rest. Um, you know, it's also advisable to stay under 5,500 in student loans. That's the combination or the maximum of your sub and unsub for your first year. Um, and that's a first year dependent student. The, the current national average student loan debt is about $28,000 in rising. Um, so there, there are valid reasons why, you know, students want to take out um, past recommended amounts because they have, you know, specific charges for their major or their career field. Um, school supplies, uh, arts, you know, supplies for specific classes um, that aren't, uh, you know, accounted for in that cost of attendance, because that cost of attendance that we've used to create a financial award is a general cost of attendance. So everyone's going to have their own specific little items, um, you know, especially in that, once again, that indirect cost section, uh, like school supplies, where that, that can range, that ranges, that range can vary greatly. Um, you know, so you want to you think carefully about that when when borrowing your loans and your loan amounts. Um, we kind of switched the screen there, but you know, first year your maximum amount was fifty five hundred. As a sophomore, it would be uh, sixty five hundred, and as a junior, it would be seventy five hundred. Um, and these are all dependent student amounts. Um, and those amounts, so as a, as a junior at seventy five hundred, and as a senior seventy five hundred. So anything past your third year, your loan amount would be seventy five hundred. That would be offered. Um, and below there, you see as an independent student, the amounts are a, a little higher. Um, so uh, we can move on. And you know, we're still talking about good loans. Student loans can be a good investment when a student is able to make a well-informed enrollment decision. Um, this means that you're enrolling at a college that will really serve and support you in reaching your goals. Um, then the loans that you take out can be a good investment in your future. You know, um, however, if a student doesn't make an informed choice and instead is rushed through their decision process, they're choosing, you know, what others tell them, or, you know, you're just going by name recognition or popularity of the school, it may not end up being a good investment. Um, and it can lead to students spending more time completing their degree because maybe, you know, you, yeah, you, you made the wrong decision and you end up transferring. You know, that's, that's not only time, but that's money, um, time lost, but it's gonna cost you money. Um, or, you know, you might not end up completing your degree and still being left with debt. So it's really important to, to kind of think about the type of financial aid packages that you're being offered and, and, and if the school's the right fit for you. So right now, I just kind of want to do, you know, a quick check for understanding. You know, we've gone over a lot of quite a bit of information. So I just want to stop for a moment. Um, to go over a few important points that we made today. So the first, um, you know, these are kind of questions to think about. I know it's kind of hard to be interactive and ask, but you want to be thinking about which types of financial aid are considered gift aid, um, meaning that you don't have to pay it back. Um, reviewing your financial aid award letters, what types of aid are sometimes less obvious, but you need to be sure that you know um, because you'll have to pay it back. And and that's you know things like loans. So that's, that's like loans, sorry about that. Um, the first one would be, you know, types of financial aid that are considered gift aid, that's your, your federal grants, your state grants and your institutional grants. 
The second one there is, um, you know, their loans. They, they're, they're often not obvious that it's a loan. Um, and the last question, once you figure out your bottom line or your gap, which is the difference between your gift aid and the total cost of attendance, what are ways that you can cover this gap? Um, you know, and we've gone over that works uh, with scholarships, you can work, you may have work study. Um, and then also, you know, you know you're filling that, that gap with loans, um, which is once again, why we don't include the loans in our initial uh, calculation, where we do just cost of attendance minus gift aid. Um, because loans would would come in to fill that gap. We don't want you to think that you have to take those loans. Loans are optional and they're there to help you fill the gap. Um, so, you know, MoneyThink um, is, is the provider of the Decided tool and, you know, they have lots of um, uh, different guides and stuff. So I would definitely say check them out. Um, I want to highlight just a few things here, you know, first and foremost, it's important that you take the time to dig into your awards. So you're sure you understand what the costs are and what aid you're receiving. Um, now that we understand colleges do their own thing their own way, it's even more important that you pay attention and use critical thinking when you're comparing your awards. Second, it's important to understand that the aid presented to you uh, for your first year of college may not be promised for all four years at that college. Um, so some of the aid may not be renewable. You'll need to ask these questions to the financial aid office to be sure that you're considering um, whether costs like tuition are fixed and whether gift aid and grants are renewable um, or if, you know, tuition, tuition usually does change year to year and um, grants usually change a little as well because um, you're applying for financial aid every year you're filling out the FAFSA. Um, and then, you know, lastly, you want to work with adults and allies um, that can recognize when you're in in, in a financially vulnerable situation so they can help you. You wanna work with your advisors at high school and you know, any college access organizations that you're a part of, or even reach out to you know, the Central Valley Scholars um, for, for advice and guidance. Uh, you need to be ready, ready to tackle the indirect costs of going to college. And you know, we're already hearing about you know, rising issues around housing and food insecurity for college students. So it's really important that you're looking at your budget and your aid. Uh, to try and avoid, uh, you know, uh, being in those situations where where you have food insecurity because you can't afford to buy, you know, your meals, or you know, rent is you can't find a, a place that's within your your budget for rent. Um, the affordability of college also means that as a student, you don't have to be distracted during your college experience, um, wondering about these things like you know your basic needs, or um, you'll be able to just focus on on being a student. Um, so that's why it's kind of the money piece is important because we don't want you to have to stress over that while you're in school. We want you to be able to just attend your classes and you know be engaged in, in, in research or interning. Um, and yeah, so those are just some kind of check-ins. Um, what I wanted to go over um, now is another resource for you called Swift Student. It's also on um, online. Um, so Swift student, you know, you kind of use this, you, you could be using this right now, it's going to help you craft financial aid appeals. So we know that even after you understand college affordability, you understand your financial aid award letter, you understand what your gap is going to be, the financial aid letter may just not be enough for you. So you're going to go back to your, your school and ask uh, for an, to appeal. There's many different reasons um, to appeal. You can do this also at multiple times throughout your college career. You know, after you, you could do this right now, appeal, um, you've received your financial aid award letter, it's not enough, you can appeal letting them know that there's been a change in financial situation, maybe your parent has lost a job because of COVID, or their hours have been reduced because of COVID, that's a change of information that you want to um, appeal and let them and let the school know. So you let the school know through this process called the appeals process. Um, you know, like I said, you can do that now um, to, to see if they can give you an updated estimate before you make your decision to enroll. Um, you, you know, you want to go in and tell them, hey, this is what my new income information looks like. Can you give me an estimate of what my financial aid package would look like? Um, this specific tool, Swift Student, it has templates for different uh, types of appeals because there are many different types of appeals. This tool is absolutely, absolutely free. Um, so I would say go check it out. Um, 
if you go to the next slide here, um, it talks, we talk a little bit more about, you know, it is template based. Um, uh, go to one more slide. Sorry. Um, so these are some types of appeals that you can apply apply for, you know, that, that, that the tool has templates for. Um, you may be asking the financial aid office to exclude parent information um, when they calculate your financial aid. Um, that's considered what's called a dependency appeal, and that's a very special type of appeal. Um, you may just be asking for more financial aid if your financial situation has changed after you filed the FAFSA, so kind of like what I talked about right now, a parent losing a job. Um, uh, you can ask for more financial aid if the FAFSA doesn't capture a financial difficulty that you're currently facing. Like, um, you know, maybe you have had medical bills that are extremely high and insurance is not covering them. You can ask them to take that into consideration. Um, you can ask them to cover the cost of a computer or other supplies that you need, need it for school. Because once again, that cost of attendance is just an average cost of attendance and they may not have um, accounted for the expense of a computer. Um, you know, if you have children, you can ask them uh, to revise your aid for dependent care costs that, that they're not taking into account. So there's many different reasons, even if, you know, say things like, you know, you have a car um, or uh, that needs uh, a repair unexpectedly, um, you can ask if they can do an appeal on your financial aid to help out with that. Um, or, you know, once again, if, if to kind of go towards medical, if you have a dental bill that came up, um, you can ask them to do that. Um, sometimes during the financial aid process, as you're already a student, maybe your second year, you know, or even your first year, maybe say after your first semester or first quarter, you don't do too well adjusting to college grade wise, you may have to submit what's called a satisfactory academic progress appeal. Um, just explaining, you know, why you didn't perform as well, um, what you're doing to fix that and, and that'll be reviewed and hopefully they'll say, yeah, we will allow you to have financial aid. Um, to show us that, you know, it was, it was just a temporary thing, you know, we were adjusting, had a hiccup there. Um, but that's also, you know, another, you know, tangent here, important point is that once you receive financial aid, you have to, you know, do certain things to remain eligible to receive that. And that's basically being a good student and completing the coursework and getting good grades. Um, so these are some reasons, you know, to appeal. Uh, like I said, you can appeal anytime. So a student, you can go ahead, excuse me, go ahead. Go to the next screen. You know, uh, it provides letter templates for you for specific types of appeals. And it also has um, templates and support for, for counselors and others who may be writing letters on your behalf. Um, a lot of the times with the appeal process, you are submitting letters of support for whatever you're claiming in the appeal. Um, so this also has tools for, like I said, your advisors or anyone that you're asking to write an appeal for you. It has these tools for them as well. And that pretty much brings us to, you know, the end of our presentation, you know, it's been a lengthy presentation um, and I'm available to take any questions. Awesome. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing the screen so I can check out the questions we have. So someone has asked so far and feel free to add questions as we begin to answer them. Um, are grants also money we don't have to pay back? What is the difference between a Pell Grant and the Cal Grant? Okay, yeah, so grants, um, anything that's labeled a grant is, you know, the free money, the gift aid that you do not have to pay back. Now, the difference between a Pell Grant, the Pell Grant comes from the federal government and you, you receive a Pell Grant based on your uh, eligibility that's determined by filling out the FAFSA. So the free FAFSA, the free application for federal student aid. The Cal grant is specific to California. Um, so the way you apply for that, there are two ways. One is through completing the FAFSA by March 2nd, the California Student Aid Commission will review all of your information and determine if you're eligible for a Cal grant and they'll, they'll notify you. Um, that's why you wanna create that web grants for students portal because that's where you can look for the Cal grant. And for our students who are filling out the California Dream Act application, that's the other way to apply for the Cal Grant. Um, so for our undocumented students or AB 540 students, when you complete the California Dream Act application, you're applying for the Cal Grant uh, funding. 
Awesome, thank you. And then as people come up with some more questions, I also wanted to drop a couple of links in the chat and I'll actually go over this on my share screen one more time. Um, but in case we have any folks who um, are looking for scholarships at the moment, or I know it's May and everyone is like kind of in the midst of making their college decisions after having heard back from, you know, it's gotten their acceptances and rejections and wait lists and all of those things. Um, so because that deadline is coming up pretty soon, I wanted to make sure everyone feels equipped with having the tools that they need in order to um, make those decisions through this webinar, but also future steps after that. What do you do once you've made that decision? Is that it? Do you just wait to go to school until fall? There are a couple of things that students um, have to do to kind of prepare for that. And um, the Dream Success Center at Fresno State actually provided provides some really, really awesome resources that you all can check out in regards to that. They have these awesome checklists that I'll open up in just a second. They also have video formats, um, very helpful. So this is applicable to not only first year students, but also transfer students in case any of you are transfer students um, looking for this information. It's very, um, it's kind of broken down in this like checklist format that's hopefully you know comprehensible and pretty easy to keep up with it is some of it is specific to Fresno State or the CSU system but most of it is really um, things that are going to apply no matter where you end up going to college so things as simple as like um, checking your email um, applying to EOP if you're a first generation or low-income student um, most colleges have the educational opportunity program or similar programs that you should begin to look at before you actually get to campus or before the semester starts. Um, just looking through the resources they have online and um, basically getting yourself ready to, to acclimate to that campus. They also have some private scholarships listed on here as well. And actually, um, well, I think I already mentioned this in the chat, but the Immigrants Rising um, scholarships that they link in here are, I think, centralized scholar scholarships are listed on there, but they also have just a bunch from all over the country, and none of them require social security numbers or proof of residency, so they are very friendly to undocumented students um, who might be applying. So definitely check these out, and we will be sending a follow-up email soon with this information. There's also the same type of checklist, but for transfer students. Uh, for the sake of time, I'll kind of breeze through some of these. Oh. Well, I'll send this link in the chat and also in the follow-up email. It's not loading on my screen because I've already filled it out, but it is basically um, a post-webinar evaluation survey that our team has come up with to get more feedback um, from you all and get your ideas on how we can improve our future webinars, improve uh, just making sure that you all got the knowledge that you needed um, from these webinars. Um, and yes, yeah, so for anyone who saw, you know, in our announcements that we're doing um, prizes, you, everyone who is still in here will be eligible if you fill out the um, post webinar evaluation form. So make sure that you fill that out. I'll try to link it now, but if that link doesn't work, do it in the follow up email. Um, so as long as you fill that out, I already kind of have like a screenshot of people's names. Um, and we will be reaching out to you again within the next following weeks um, once we get some responses and just saying, hey, thank you so much for attending. Here's the recording of the webinar. It's posted on the website. And also here is your you know, gift card. Um, so definitely keep an eye out for those things. We really would appreciate your feedback, not only on this webinar, but on how we can just improve overall and what resources you all would like to see. And finally, the last thing I will plug is our upcoming webinar happening um, on the 24th. All the information and Eventbrite is already up on our website, uh, centralvalleyscholars.org slash workshops. And this one is going to be a student panel on how to pick a college and do the appeals process. So very similar, we've talked about appeals um, already, but this is also just gonna get into that further and hear firsthand experiences um, and provide additional resources on top of what Robert has already provided. Um, so definitely check out all of our, our past resources as well and register to our upcoming workshops. If there's no more questions, which it seems like it's not, oh, okay. Oh, awesome, yay, someone said thank you. Yes, thank you all for being here. I hope to see you all again at future webinars. Um, oh, let me check again. Oh, awesome. Um, yeah, and I believe that's it. We will probably send a bunch of these things in a follow-up email. So thank you all for being here. And Robert, thank you so much. I want to be respectful of, of everyone's time. So I think- You're very welcome. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here and share some information. All right, perfect. So, all right, I'm going to go ahead and end it here. But thank you all for coming. Enjoy your weekend. Um, and we will hopefully be seeing you next Saturday. All right, have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.